Hi everybody, I'm Dr. Richard Stevenson and I'm the director of Stevenson Dental Solutions in San Dimas, California. We are a hands-on teaching center that focuses on excellence and today we are going to discuss the PFM on tooth number 30. I'm going to utilize the Acadental Model Pro 1 Typodont. It's a very popular Typodont by many testing agencies and also being used by several dental schools. And today our preparation is going to focus on a PFM where the occlusal reduction is the first step. And for this we can utilize a series of different types of burrs, the 856-016 or the 847-KR-016, but basically start off with the C-plane and you want to use uh, the burr to your advantage and understanding that the thickness of this diamond is 1.6 millimeters at its widest area. The tip, on the other hand, measures 1.1 millimeter. I'm using the RGS-4 as a guide, which is 1.5 millimeters wide. And we can perform this check in the mouth as well. With the PFM, we're looking at two millimeters of occlusal clearance when we're finished. So a 1.5 millimeter depth plane, not a depth cut necessarily, but a depth plane like we're doing here is a very effective technique to get to the, that two millimeters that we're looking for. And so we just continue uh, prepping and checking. You can see here that we're just a little bit under reduced. So we'll go back and reduce a little bit more and verify that reduction with the RGS-4. There are numerous ways we can check occlusal clearance. We can use putties, we can use different types of uh, matrices, uh, we can use wax, we can use bite registration or bite uh, preparation tabs, uh, but I find it pretty easy just to go ahead and use this instrument that uh, has a known measurement. There we go much closer to uh, 1.5 millimeters. And once we're done with that mesolingual cusp, we'll just go ahead and migrate on to the distolingual cusp and perform exactly the same function across this C-plane, this non-functional cusp reduction that we're doing. But we're not doing it all flat, we're doing it to mimic the triangular ridges. This diamond's getting a little bit uh, worn out, and I can usually resurface it and get a few more uh, minutes of use out of it, but it's just about had it. So there we go, we're looking at 1.5 millimeters with the RGS-4. Now I'd like to do the A-plane next, uh, not the B-plane, but the A-plane. And we're gonna angle the diamond so that it parallels the C-plane. And we try to follow the morphology of the cusp a little bit so that uh, we have a rise and fall. That'll allow us to match the opposing a little bit better. But you can see how the A-plane and C-plane are nearly parallel to each other. After finishing the C plane and A plane, we can now turn our attention to the B plane, which uh, is quite easy because uh, most of it's gone uh, at this point, uh, the upper portion anyway, by doing the A plane. And uh, we just follow the rise and fall of the triangular ridges, including the distal cusp. So there you go, you can verify that you have 1.5 millimeters of clearance at this point. So let's use the RGS-4. We know that's 1.5 millimeters wide, so we can just slip it in here and we can see that indeed we do have, from incline to incline, at least 1.5 millimeters of clearance. And after we're done smoothing, we'll probably have closer to two. I like to make a, a few dots like this on the buckle cusps after I finish the A, B, and C planes because if you've done them right, the buckle cusp tips line up with the unprepared teeth 
distal, and mesial. Looks pretty good. Just make sure that that A plane and C plane parallel to each other. Well, why don't we move on to the axial reduction. And for this step, I like to use the 878K012. It uh, can make a chamfer for, for you, but the chamfer is going to be quite narrow. And most of the time you want to have a chamfer that's probably closer to 0.5 to 0.7 millimeters in axial depth. This uh, very skinny tipped tapered diamond won't provide you with adequate chamfer depth. And remember a chamfer has a an angle that's at least 45 degrees downward towards the tissue. Uh, this provides that for you very nicely but it's just a little on the narrow side. It's kind of a good idea to set your finish line location at 0.5 millimeters above the tissue and then you can always uh, lower it if you need to. If you tend to go subgingival like so many of our students do, uh, I would suggest you go a little higher up. If you've done this step correct, you're going to leave these little unprepared sections in approximately and these you're going to remove uh, in the very next step. I like to keep these as narrow as possible buckle-lingually. Okay, so let's get started with interproximal clearance. And for this, I like to use a needle shaped burr. This is an 859010, it's very skinny. You could also use an 850012. Some people even use a 169L. So anything uh, of that nature can work quite well. There are really three keys uh, when trying to break interproximal contact. One is don't go too deep axially, don't over taper, and then don't hit the adjacent tooth. And it's, it's tough to do uh, the first two, but we can definitely protect the adjacent tooth by leaving a little sliver here. And that works out pretty well. Remember, when we're doing this uh, interproximal clearance step, we are not interested in developing a perfect finish line. We're just interested in clearing the tooth from between the teeth and if the tooth structure. So if you can just focus on that, that that's really helpful. Um, Sometimes uh, we, we get so worried about hitting the adjacent tooth, you tip the burr in towards the prep you're doing and you over prep or maybe you um, over taper. So it's important just to think about just breaking contact and your margin is going to look terrible at this point. You're really not going to have a very pretty looking finish line. Um, I'm just lowering it down a little bit so that we have at a very minimum 0.5 millimeters of space between the preparation finish line and the adjacent tooth. This will allow us to scan that area with an optical scanner. Uh, it'll allow you to uh, place retraction cord very easily as well. And so I, I'm just doing the mesial here a little quicker uh, so you can see how we can break contact. And we don't have to hit the adjacent teeth. Now it kind of looks like a mess right now. You've got a lot of irregularities on the axial walls. So let's equalize the taper and let's make that nice and smooth all the way around. And for that, I'm going to use the 878K012 again. And I'd been using that earlier to develop the initial axial reduction and to set the finish line location. But now I'm going to go around and I'm going to equalize the taper. I'm going to see areas that are over tapered and correct them, areas that are under tapered and correct them. I may need to lower the finish line slightly so it's more uniformly above the tissue. I'll smooth off the transitions so I won't have any sharp edges between the um, surfaces. If I have an area like here on the distal that seemed a little bit over tapered, I can upright that wall a little bit as I lower the finish line. We can get a little bit more bulk. Uh, we're definitely going to want to have a little bit more bulk for the metal on the lingual here and for the ceramic in other areas. So we can get things a lot closer with the 878K by going around this step. You know, when I learned this preparation, I was never taught this. I was taught you had to do every step just ideal, and and I always felt that it was just too difficult uh, to do that. So it's kind of nice to have this um, system in place where you can go back and refine things. This is the secondary plane, and this is done for contour purposes and for the need to have adequate thickness of the ceramic. 
you don't want to prepare that facial surface with just one plane. It's got to have two planes. So when we move on to the chamfer refinement step, we're going to utilize this 8877009, and uh, my students have always called, called this the chamfer fixer because it does such a really great job of making your chamfer ideal and having it decline at about 60 degrees. Um, I'm a little bit uh, discouraged sometimes when I see uh, chamfers that look more like shoulders to me. Uh, they don't have that declination angle. They don't allow you to have a metal seal, a slip joint effect. So um, when you're doing a chamfer, a true modified chamfer, um, you want to have them decline like these here. So let's uh, now create the shoulder. And you notice that we're doing the FGC kind of prep first, and now we're going to convert this to a PFM by further reducing the facial, creating his shoulder, and then also uh, removing a little bit more occlusally. So the location of the shoulder on the mesial starts at the facial aspect of the interproximal contact and then the shoulder extension on the distal does not need to go that far interproximally because it's a not an aesthetic area it's just over reduction so let's make sure that we're into the contact area here so that when the patient smiles they're not going to show any metal but on the distal just go over to the line angle uh, between the distal and the facial. I might need to move that over a little bit more distally. So maybe right there would be better. Moving that shoulder interproximally on the distal makes no sense to me at all and it's very aggressive. So I'm just highlighting the, the area of the internal that's going to be deepened from let's say 0.5 or 0.6 millimeters deep at this point to 1.1 millimeters deep. More than one, but probably less than 1.2. So 8847KR016 is the burr we like to use. It's a flattened diamond that has a tip that's wider than the RGS3. It's 1.1. And here's the RGS4 just for comparison, 1.5 millimeter. Some people ask for a 1.5 millimeter shoulder uh, I think that's um, very aggressive. I don't think that that is a good idea. I own a dental laboratory and we don't need 1.5 millimeters at all to develop beautiful uh, PFM aesthetics. I think that's a significant uh, over preparation. So let's try to save two structure and keep that shoulder uh, right around one millimeter. Much less than one millimeter makes it very difficult for the lab technicians to create a very nice uh, aesthetic uh, final look. So let's um, try to be one millimeter to uh, 1.2. So I like to just say, hey, why don't you just make it 1.1 because that's how wide the end of the burr is. And obviously uh, every time I'm, I'm doing action shots here, I'm speeding them up 2x so that we can get through the, uh, these preparation parts a little bit more quickly. So, you know, it's a good idea to get out the RGS-3 as another way to verify, have I gone deep enough? No, not even close. See that? You're not even close. You maybe, have, maybe you've made it a shoulder, but it's not deep enough. So on the mesial, it looks good, but on the, the mid part in the distal uh, buccal area, it's definitely not 1.1 millimeter deep. So we just have to continue. And remember that every time you, you deepen the shoulder, you're going to want to reestablish the taper and even reestablish the secondary plane, which you may have removed in the process of remo removing more facial tooth structure. This is also a good time to, there we go, this is a good time to uh, smooth off the finish line too and get the proper shoulder, which is going to make a 90 degree angle between the, the, the finish line and the unprepared tooth structure. You can see these little wings that are left over. Um, it's popular in some areas to leave them, but I always have felt that it just adds an added um, complication to the prep uh, because you have to make those wings have proper taper. Uh, they're kind of like a retention groove in some respects. So I like to remove them. And for that, uh, we can utilize the KS0F burr.
this is kind of an interesting approach because it's it's um, one millimeter wide and you can see with the RGS 3 you can see that it's one millimeter wide and it's round ended so it allows you to blend the shoulder into a chamfer by utilizing that round end as it migrates through a transition from a shoulder to a chamfer and it works out pretty well so it's it's kind of a new technique that I'm doing um, and it seems to be working really well with with students doing PF amps they're having a much easier time transitioning between shoulder and chamfer uh, it, it's sort of a an easier way to do it. It is a little thicker, so it's a little bit harder to get between the teeth. So you may have to um, go back to some other burrs for certain areas, but with a little bit of care, you can usually uh, do a pretty good job transitioning that. Yeah, so it looks like things are moving along pretty well. Let's play some bevels uh, between the occlusal and the axial walls. For this we can use a carbide like a 7404. Uh, you can use a 7102. You can even use the burr we were just using, that KS0F. The key is that you don't want to have any sharp edges between the occlusal and the axial that might impede the, the, the lab work and the fabrication of the, um, the coping. Any sharp edges could, could complicate the laboratory work. So here you see uh, the preparation is pretty close to being done. And let's go ahead and check out the clearance. Uh, this is an RGS-4, so it's 1.5, and it fits easily with a little bit of wiggle. That's what you really want to see. And the type is fully clothed together, so we know we're not um, getting an, you know, an inaccurate measurement here. You can go through excursives just to make sure that you don't have any unseen areas that need to be reduced. Uh, previously, you know, undetected areas. So take a look at the shoulder. We went with that 1 to 1.2 and, and there's the RGS uh, 3 which uh, fits inside of there um, and, and it really gives you a really good idea of how well you did on that shoulder. Off-angle chisels are kind of nice if you really want to refine the occlusal. You don't need to do this. I, I'm just having some fun. Um, this is absolutely uh, not necessary. Sorry to um, show you this a little bit, but um, it's just for me, it's fun. And here I can remove any loose enamel rods, make sure there's no ski jump. And for this, um, this is a really good reason to, to buy that instrument uh, is to have that um, smoothing effect on the finish line. So uh, there you have it. Uh, the preparation has been completed. It has pretty good draw, and you can see that it definitely goes from chamfer to shoulder. Uh, and uh, no undercuts. The adjacent teeth look like they weren't scratched by uh, the burr while we're going interproximal. And sometimes uh, that alone is a, is a great victory. <laughs> and so um, I want to thank you for the um, time you spent with me. I love the suggestions and the feedback. Uh, I appreciate your comments. If you ever want to uh, come and see me in person, would love to have you take one of our courses. Uh, check out the website. We've got lots of really cool courses and products and stuff up there. So thanks again, everybody. Have a great 4th of July.